in football, in most of the countries I, I've been working, um, it's, it's quite difficult to find players who are able to, to do heavy squat or heavy load training. Yes, and then you think that what, what happens, what translates into the injury side of the thing and the prevention comes from the fact that you manage to load them through this approach rather than without this approach, they would not be able to load. And that just because you find a, a way to work. Hi everyone, uh, today we have uh, the great Julio Tus uh, with us. Uh, Julio, how are you? Fine, good morning. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super, super excited to, to have you on, on the, on the podcast because I believe that, uh, I don't, I don't like, there's no many people that have managed to, to bring you on in, into those, uh, those podcasts. You kind of often working on, on your side a little bit in, in the shade. Um, but if you just start maybe by telling us a little bit of who you are and the history and all the clubs you, you work for, I think people will definitely understand the, the value of uh, hearing from uh, from someone like you. Okay, uh, thanks uh, first of all for your kind invitation. So uh, I would consider myself as a strength and power coach. Uh, I used to be a basketball coach. This is maybe my... Uh, my soul is, is about being a, a basketball coach, but at the end, it was impossible to, to continue to evolve on, on this uh, job. And, and then uh, suddenly I found that I had an, an opportunity to, to work as a strength and power coach uh, for the first time at a uh, full-time basis at FC Barcelona 2003. And um, maybe that was the first time in Spain that a professional in a full-time basis started to, to work for a pro team, mainly for that um, kind of level. So that, that was Barcelona to start with. And can you just tell the, the, the listeners as well, from where do you coach? Because that's nice as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm coaching from Tenerife. This is my hometown. Uh, most of the time... Uh, during the last two years, I, I'm in Tenerife during the winter. Uh, this is a paradise because I, I, I could also train outdoor and, and sometimes for the players it's quite uh, nice to see you outdoor working with a palm tree or, or whatever. So uh, yes, and the, the, the beach makes, and the, the, uh, video, <laughs> the video you sent us. Yeah, you sent us. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, you know, I go to the beach uh, on a daily basis to train also there uh, and to swim um, and to some kind of a, a, a snorkel. Um, I'm lucky then then to move to Mallorca. That is my second paradise because my father is, is from there and I also train from there. So I'm, I'm all the time moving between both places. Sometimes I go to to the home places of the, of the players and I train there. Uh, sometimes once a month or whatever, it depends of the of the time schedule, schedule of, of mine and of, of them. No, nice. So yeah, of course. I, and you you showed me some uh, some video. You were, we connect. We were connected to your your GoPros, yeah. your webcam in, in the garden with yeah. all the all the mini gym you have in your house, and that's that's incredible. Um, of course, like I wanted to bring you here to for for you to really go into more the details and the, the history of your training uh, philosophy. But before that, just more another global question about, like we, we just went through your, your journey, the different clubs, like imagine that just who has a CV like you going from Barcelona, Juventus, national team, Chelsea, Inter. This is, I don't, I don't know anyone else that has um, been through the, the clubs you, you, you wear. And now working in your home, um, having a walk on the beach in the morning. So do you think you could have done what you're doing right now if you had not gotten through those clubs having the legitimacy and the learnings that are coming from that level. I don't think anyone can say, I'm going to coach you from the beach, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. That's, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, but I, I have other, other partners or friends from, from, from my group who is doing maybe not the same, but quite, quite similar. So it's about 
your commitment with the player and how you are able to evolve in some way to improvise uh, all the problems that could happen to you uh, when you're working um, online. Uh, for sure, COVID has been um, uh, in some way the the reason for for all this because uh, even even for them it was quite difficult to move from their homes uh, during a lot of parts of the mainly the last season um, and I had the opportunity also during that part that even one of the players were uh, infected by COVID so he was not able to go out of home during two weeks so uh, in 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 that way for for him that particular player uh, is is perfect he's got his gym at, at, at home some of the of the equipment is is mine because i had uh, you know spare uh, at home so i say okay i'm, I'm gonna send it to you so you don't need to buy and, mm -hmm. um, during our relationship, you're going to have that for free. It's, it's not a problem. And when I see that um, any equipment or whatever uh, could be helpful for for our training, I introduce uh, very, very soon. So I uh, think also that for a football player, it's going to be something useful because he doesn't need to pay you to stay there. Because, for example, uh, imagine you're a football player, you have your own stuff. That is something that, that is... Uh, more and more common. Yes, yeah, yes. Growing. Every every month is growing. So some of them, they have a lot of stuff. And nutritionists, physical therapists, psychologists, uh, fitness coach, whatever. So, uh, may, uh, okay, if you are at the top five players in the world, Money is not an issue for you, but if, if you are a, an average player or even, I don't know, top 100 or whatever, maybe you don't want to pay, I don't know, four or five people to live at your hometown uh, with all the expenses, uh, you know, flats, uh, whatever, because it's in some way a, a lot of money. So maybe some of them, they don't care, but for sure, money is a, it's a big issue for for a lot of them, um, um, this is in some way much more cheaper than having a, a, a staff only for you at that particular city. Yeah, but then, you know, we always talk about the importance <clears throat> of knowing the, 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 the context of the player. There are things that you need to be with him. You know that sometimes just the way he comes in the room in the morning, his attitude, his mood. How do you get the feel of, yeah. of that online? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You learn, uh, you learn uh, about that uh, every time you train. Uh, you realize uh, from from the posture or or from uh, everything he's talking to you uh, what you are able to do that day or what you are not able. No, um, for sure, uh, first we we'll, we always have a, a chat. So, brief, brief, yeah, chat. Mm -hmm. briefing, no, like when you go into an airplane, if you work with a group. They have a small briefing to talk about it. Uh, how's everything going? How do you feel? Are you tired? Any don'ts? Whatever. Um, it, it's about uh, you know the experience you you have yeah, that you learn suddenly in just two seconds what you're able to do, and if you need to change something you you thought before and you realize you are not able to do. You have to adapt day. On, yeah, and on, on the sure. fly, I guess, no? On the fly. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then, for sure, it depends on the time of the week. If you're working after a, a match, for sure, you're going to need to recover and what we call a compensation a training a, to realign all the structures that are in some way torn and, and out of place. Um, that's going to help him to to recover faster. And then you have maybe the middle of the week when you could overload a little bit and then the preparation for the game. That is okay. the, the three kind of different approaches you could have during the week. Um, usually we work between three or four times a week, sometimes more. If you need, it depends of, of the time of the season and, and the needs of, of the player. 
Okay, but that's a perfect segue to dive a little bit now deeper into your, your let's say, your overall approach. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll be super excited to hear a bit more about those specific uh, sessions, the rotation of those sessions, depending on the day of the week. Um, so I would say, just to bring a little bit more, more context, the first time I, let's say, heard from you was from or some of my Spanish colleagues, of course, namely uh, Alberto Mendez Villanueva, who always mm -hmm. kept mentioning your, your work. And um, <coughs> like the, the word associated with, uh, it was Julio Tus, eccentric, versapulli, variability, those kind of things. And even now, everyone, especially in Spain, you, you are the first person that is always associated with this training approach. So can you give us a little bit more context and the history and what is it about actually? Okay, first of all, I'm, I'm coming what the, we call the, the Barcelona School. The Barcelona School, the first guy to introduce the concept was for sure Paco Seiruro, who is the, the former conditioning coach and the legendary condition, strength and conditioning coach from FC Barcelona, first in, in Humboldt, where they won uh, almost everything. I don't know how many European Cups. Um, and then he moves to to, to football um, at the late stage of, of Johan Cruyff. Then, uh, you know, Fangal, uh, Rijkaard, Guardiola, Forsuar. All, it was a long period of 20 years. Uh, he was uh, my teacher at the at the INEF, where, where is the sports science school in Barcelona. And then we there we, we build a, a group um, of different uh, so different knowledge in the sense of uh, of the of a topic. So I was mainly involved with strength and power. Then we have other other persons like for example Gerard Moras who was more involved in the in the flexibility and the, um, how you combine flexibility with the strengths that at that time was completely separated. Uh, then we have people like, like Javier Jorge uh, with speed, uh, but speed close to strength, and, and other professionals who start to build that concept uh, together with Cerulo. So mm -hmm. all of them uh, work at some particular part of uh, their career for for Barca, different teams. For example, all the all the legendary players from basketball uh, were coached by uh, Javier Jorge, who is the the professional I just uh, mentioned. Um, then at the at the football part, other parts of the of this uh, school were at the academy or at uh, some particular time uh, the first team. So we start to build that. Uh, I had the opportunity to start there uh, to work and, and introduce for the first time. Maybe you know it was by chance because at that time I remember 2003, um, some people from California, uh, close to LA in Costa Mesa, brought the first Versa Puli to Spain. Uh, they contacted me because I was maybe the the only guy in barcelona who was a member of the nca at that time then you know the nca grew uh, huge um, I, and became a, an international let's say uh, association before it was just american uh, and, and no one went to the congress i used to to go to the congress during the 90s and i and so i start to to have relationship with people from the U.S. at that time. So they contacted me, they brought the first Versa Pule, uh, which is a, a flywheel, uh, but with the opportunity of uh, building like 3D movements, so mm -hmm. very complex movements. And at the same time, uh, I was also lucky to meet Per Tess, the professor Tess from Karolinska, Inst Karolinska Institute, who was living at Barcelona, or who was the, during the year living in Barcelona, uh, who brought also the other flywheel, who, who had more research um, uh, background. That is the, the legendary yo-yo machines who were designed for, for the NASA. So at that time, also, Carl Askling, who wrote maybe the first paper about injury prevention 
uh, we using flywheel uh, with a professional team in in the Swedish league also came to Barcelona and he brought me uh, his paper that last maybe I don't know two years to to publish at that time at the Scandinavian Journal of Sports Science. So we 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 start that relationship. So in, in some way I was lucky to combine the the Barcelona School creativity with the science from Scandinavia, with the experience from the United States, and, and I start to build the, the proposal. Then uh, everything uh, was in, explode in some way with the opportunity to work with uh, professional football teams. Um, and then I was lucky also to have uh, very good uh, partners, mainly in Sevilla, who was the a training center, maybe one of the, the first in Spain uh, called uh, uh, BF uh, Sport. And there, uh, I don't know, four or five guys from that uh, center have, have been working in pro teams all around Europe, in Premier League, in Italy, uh, in Spain. So we have Luis Suarez Arrones, who is also well known from his paper, Javier Nunez, mm -hmm. uh, also also a um, uh, very usual uh, writer uh, about uh, papers uh, related with Flywheel, Rafa Maldonado, mm -hmm. who is now at Real Sociedad, and Chema Quintana, who used to work at, at, at Watford. So we start to build that community uh, that grew up, um, uh, you know, it's been 20 years and we start uh, we to to build that, uh, so we, we're still growing. That's the only thing I, I I could say. Yeah, and then so let's go back. Uh, I think that that's great, and I'm I'm glad we went through this history because that that's even some details I was not completely aware of. So that that's great. So, but now go back. Let's go back. Let's try to to dive into the the mechanisms and why would you choose yo-yo versus a squat or a deadlift if it's vertical? Okay, and then. The stuff with the Versa Pulley, the, all the video you showed me, uh, integrating the ball, the, the movement variability, and this kind of thing. So, what's the the, the, okay. the theory behind in comparison to the more traditional way of, of lifting? I would say. Yeah. Okay. First of all, the flywheel that was the, the uh, training method that we, we have more, uh, let's say, uh, background scientific background from from Sweden, mainly from that Pertes group and, and Hans Berg. I moved there uh, around uh, 2004 to start my my postdoc uh, with them. I was invited to to join them uh, for a grant they had uh, um, with the European Space Agency, and we moved I remember to to Scotland to Aberdeen to perform a study comparing just exactly what you are asking. Uh, what is the difference between a squat squatting heavy squatting with the flywheel? So we moved there with all the equipment and, and we did uh, MRIs and EMG to compare this. And, and then that was the doctoral thesis of Lina Norbram, that is one of the, uh, with also with Bjorn Alner. Uh, maybe it's the two first uh, doctoral dissertations during the early 2000s that, that were presented. And I, and I collaborated with them on that as a strength and power coach with all the technique and all the maybe the various variations we could uh, introduce on that training method. What we found was that at least it was something similar and in some way superior to, to the classical or conventional uh, way of training because we were able to involve um, to a greater extent uh, ma uh, very important muscles, like for example, rectus femoris. So what we have done was to compare something similar to the squat, but um, more horizontal position. That is the so-called multi-gym flywheel machine. Um, and in that way, you were able to stand your hip. Um, rectus femoris was much more involved. And rectus femoris, everybody knows, that is a very very important muscle for for athletes, um, not only individual athletes, but also in football because of the kicking and the high speed running. 
and maybe with the squatting and other exercise, you're not able to to increase uh, the work on that particular muscle because you are not able to use your hip. So that is mainly because later on uh, appear all these hip thrust uh, exercise or variations, and mm -hmm. a lot of people are using because with the traditional approach, you're not able to use in a proper way that, that particular muscle. So we found that um, you have more activity, you have, so the muscle is, is more involved after the MRI study, but this is a very small part because it, yeah, it's just comparing one exercise mm -hmm. versus the other. So then the versus bully uh, appear, so we start to to make you know the the applications to in, to real sports, but then we were able to to do the first study that was maybe two thousand five or or six something like this with a, a youth team like between sixteen seventeen years old, and we were lucky that one of the coaches from the we had two teams, one of the teams the coach didn't believe in in that method in that combination method um so we use that team as a control group so they did the so-called mm -hmm. sequential training from Gilles committee that was mainly to combine jumpings with uh, heavier loads yeah kind uh, of contrast no, plyometrics yeah, yeah contrast training plyometrics mm -hmm. but uh, not so heavy loads mainly it was on the optimal load um uh, Power curve, this kind of thing. Yeah, power yeah. curve. Yeah. Okay. So they were using that, and so we we were able to to measure before and after, and we found that the the main difference was on the change of direction uh, speed, and that was the first paper to publish later on, ten years later, because we were not <laughs> pro on writing, um, and and that has been a, a pretty nice publication with a lot of sites because it was the the, the first time uh, we were able to in some way demonstrate the usefulness of this kind of training methods uh, in the, in that context. You need mm -hmm. to think that when you have you, uh, young players, it's gonna be easier to to improve, but also. The other team was also doing, a, we consider a useful training method, but maybe not, not as useful because they did not introduce all this variability and mainly what we call the force vector concept, no? to uh, train specific vectors, rota rotational movements, uh, and so on. And that was maybe the reason I, I consider we had the transfer to improve the change of direction as other other groups have found during the last uh, years after that paper. Yeah, I think like for, for me, like because of course I followed that and I've been implementing this as well. Uh, I remember one of the first thing when I joined uh, Paris in 2014, so that was a while ago that you guys were already doing it everywhere in the world. I was like, of, okay, shall we introduce also this, this approach versus the more traditional way? And then there's a lot of things you have to make in, take into consideration when you make a decision, when you, tr like when you bring something new, let's say, you know, everyone yeah. is used to the traditional way. You go, as you said, at least same effects as traditional. That's, that's already one thing you have to know. But then is it going to help you to get something different as well in terms of performance, in terms of muscle structure? And mm -hmm. last point for me, and that's why I was I brought it in, and that's what I learned from you and from Luis at this time. I was spending a lot of time in Sevilla with Luis about more the fact that, as you said, it's sometimes easier to load a player, especially a football player that doesn't have any back. So there's a point if you want to, let's say, do some heavy strength, there's no way you can ask him to, to put a, uh, some, some weight yeah. on his back. And that was probably the entry. And I remember a, a few, a few, few young players, like uh, 18, 19 years old, they were not playing much. They were training with the first team, not playing much. So we had the opportunity to, to load them, but no way we could have loaded them with, uh, on a squat bar. So in this case, the yo-yo was incredibly useful, for example. Mm. So yeah. using it as another entry, just easy, easy loading rather than looking at that ad adaptation, for example. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, that is a good point, Martin, because uh, that was actually our 
uh, success start from there because at, at Barcelona team, no one of the players from the first thing at that particular time, I don't know later or before, but at that particular time had experience doing heavy squat. So uh, <laughs> I'm not able to um, to introduce all this period of adaptation to learn technique or, or whatever with them. I don't have time. They, exactly. they, they are asking me for results. And the reason that we have not talked uh, much about it, I, I start to work for them was because they were looking for an injury prevention training program. But at that time, and this is in relation with the Karaskin paper, the seminar paper from Carl, mm -hmm. um, we designed in some way a, a project for them saying that uh, with this particular kind of training, we were uh, sure that we were able to reduce the injury rate, at least if we, if we count um the availability of the players for for playing matches that was the 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 way we count the injury prevention no? how many days mm -hmm. are, are they uh, available yep. instead of uh, the number of injuries so we found a huge reduction with with in, in this particular parameter um and that was the start of the of the whole oh, thing because yes. then uh, all, other persons in the world like like Roberto Sassi who was going to Sandoria in Italy uh, asked me to to introduce that later in Juve and everything start from there so it, it's a good point because in, in football in most of the countries I, I've been working um, it's, it's quite difficult to find players who are able to to do heavy squat or heavy load training? Yes, and then you think that <clears throat> what what happens, what translates into the injury side of the thing and the prevention comes from the fact that you manage to load them through this approach rather than without this approach, they would not be able to load, and that just because you find a, a way to work, or there is also some specific adaptation to this type of work because we know. And again, from the, 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 the initial readings I've made, that there is a bigger emphasis on the eccentric side of the things as yeah. well with these machines. Mm -hmm. yeah. So would you weight both in the, in the mix? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, then, then for sure, you have some, some adaptation that right now we, we know for sure. At first, it was we had some doubts because uh, no one had uh, the performed any study uh, using flywheel to see the the architecture of the, the muscle architecture adaptation and then we have uh, those studies um, i remember maybe the name is uh, Preslan, as, as far as mm -hmm. i know from australia who who found the uh, real change in the fascicles of the biceps femoris after doing uh, legal movements or whatever then for sure that kind of stimuli uh, you need to enrich you need to improve that stimuli and not also doing this kind of uh, movement, just one exercise. You need to uh, increase the variability of the exercise to adapt the whole structure from a pretty complex um, uh, muscle like, like the hamstring, for example, or even the quad for the retus femoris that is in some way quite unique uh, muscle because it's quite long, etc. So. We have that part, you really are able to uh, modify the architecture of the muscle so they become less prone to injuries because it's longer and is more able to absorb energy when you have the overstretching part of the movement. When you are doing a, a high speed break or high speed running or whatever. But then you have the functional part that, that is as, as much as important because you have. For example, all the increase on the uh, feed forward mechanisms that we could understand this as the increase in productivity before uh, any footstep foot on the ground. So if you are able to anticipate any footstep uh, every time you touch the ground with a proper posture and a proper activation and you increase the activity before doing that movements, for sure you are going to reduce also the forces that all the all the joints or muscles are are suffering. Uh, so that is 
the first part of the motor control, let's say three, and, and then you have how to, for example, anticipate to any perturbation you have mm -hmm. uh, from partners or op opponents or, or whatever. So uh, that is the way we read the, the training to increase the motor control, uh, not only during the movement, but also before the movement. So uh, players focus a lot on that particular part of the motor control um, and they increase, let's say, their uh, awareness to everything that is happening, that sometimes with the conventional approach, uh, you are only focused on technique. You are, it's like interoception <laughs> process and you don't realize what is happening outside from, from yeah, it's and also it's rigid you tend to again if we take the example of a squat or even if you were just like a pushing uh, pushing a sled to work more on your posterior chain and more horizontal mm -hmm. types of force of application yeah. you would still need you will still be in a very confined and defined pattern exactly. hip extension yeah. knee extension it is very confined yeah. and what i've all what i've seen with especially with the versa pulley you change yeah. sometimes you open the hip you open the knee yeah. You change the flexion, the angles, and I guess that's yeah, why yeah, you mentioned about the, the variability and you're just touching the, the wider ranges of force yeah, expression, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, it's a concept that the Russians used to talk a lot in, in all these old books. It's uh, dynamic correspondence to the, to the real movement. Uh, this is in some way, uh, I don't say in the conventional is, is wrong per se. This is something uh, you could uh, use in some particular stages if you need it. But then what, what, is, what we are missing is uh, what happens in the middle. What is the transfer between all these strengths or power you, you build with those, as you say, close um, street uh, movement patterns uh, to reach the real movement on competition? And that, that is maybe. Uh, what research needs to add to all the strength and conditioning coaches, because you don't find many many papers, many investigations about that transfer part. Yep. Yeah, all the transfer. Uh, people talk about transfer. Every everybody understands the concept, but uh, we we need those different levels of um, approach to the real movement and we are missing that and we are working most of the time at what we call the zero or one level and um, competition for us is the fifth level because we use that kind of, of approach is uh, between zero or uh, zero close to one to to five so it's, it's about seven different seven different uh, levels of proximity of approach uh, to the to the real movement so you need to work all of them and you need to combine during the season and even during the the, the week all these kind of, uh, of approaches everything mm -hmm. is valid if you know uh, when and where to introduce uh, every approach yeah and <clears throat> nothing that that's that makes to total sense so trying to just to summarize a little bit that was my view and i'm glad we definitely you kind of confirm or explain a bit give more background so uh the fact that you can load that you teach other movement pattern transfer what about the the time efficiency also again back to the eccentric part and i look looks like the when i see what you guys prescribe in terms of volume series it tends to be way less than what is prescribed in terms of rep repetition with traditional training. Can you comment a little bit on, on, on that as well? Yeah, we, we've been suffering also with some particular players because they were expecting ma uh, much more load in, in, in what we call congestion and the, and the feeling of a lot of blood flow on the muscles and, you know, like feeling like, like a bodybuilding uh, a process. And what we, what we have done is to avoid all the, let's say, multi-set approach. So mm -hmm. we just work on a one-set basis. And then what we do, okay, is this, a, if we're talking a particular muscle group, a specific muscle group that we are in, interested in, in 
foreign seed or, or whatever, like the hands that is so important in, in soccer, instead of doing three sets or four sets of a particular exercise, mm -hmm. we do four different exercises. Each exercise, um, let's say, uh, focusing on different parts of, of the movement or with different uh, potential approach to uh, develop a particular movement or, or a particular part of that muscle. Okay, so uh, if we introduce, for example, rotation to the to a hamstring movement, it's a completely different approach than if you just work on a flexion of the of the knee or extension of the hip. If we introduce rotation, it's a completely different way because also this particular muscle group um, has this ability to, to rotate. And most of the, of the coaches, they neglect that very important part of, of the function of the hamstring. So, um, uh, as I said before, for us it's so important to uh, increase the variability just using that particular uh, approach. Instead of three or four sets, just change the exercise and, and look for another way of mm -hmm. developing the, that muscle or that particular movement if we are working on the, on the functional part. Because I, I guess anyone has the creativity or just maybe looking at different, to different professionals or reading to find a, a huge uh, variability of exercise to change the classical approach, the conventional approach that comes from uh, weightlifting or from bodybuilding, that mm -hmm. was always introduced three to four sets. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Every single exercise or movement pattern will be, will, they all go in the same direction, but we we'll tend to probably touch uh, different muscle fibers, different, different angles. And uh, yeah, and the, the next question uh, related to that is how do you uh, choose the appropriate uh, load because you won't be doing an one R one RM and then work mm -hmm. at percentage of that one RM. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you want to follow that approach, uh, right now every year is easier to do that because when when I start to work with these kind of devices, it was quite difficult to have uh, any any assessment. And, and it was quite embarrassing, let's say, to do the assessment because we were using muscle lab that at that time was the, the unit we had to measure. So we used a strain gate, uh, a force sensor with an encoder, and it was a mess because we had all the cables around and the <laughs> player was just uh, worrying about what happens with the cables. So, so it was quite, quite difficult. Then later, we developed, uh, mainly with Marco Pozzo, uh, who, who is an engineer who worked with me at, at Sweden in Stockholm, at, at KI with Bertes Group, um, a sensor to collect the, um, uh, let's say, the power from the revolutions per second of the wheel, of the flywheel. That flywheel turns the spin on uh, in, in high-speed manner, and you're able to collect the, the number of revolutions per second, and then you have formulas with the um, angular velocity and the, the shape of the cone or whatever, or, or even the inertias. You introduce on the formula and you got the power. We, we validate that and, and, and we start to work on that particular way. And now we have uh, finally the four sensors in a Bluetooth uh, with Bluetooth communication, so mm -hmm. we have a very, very small uh, unit, like 100 grams, that is attached to the to the handle or the harness or whatever, and also the device, and you collect and you have on your iPad or, or iPhone uh, on a real time, the, the let's say, the, the power or the speed or whatever you want. So from that, uh, you are able to, to make a, a proper decision making of, of the loading, for example, how many reps, what is the, the uh, rest period between sets, uh, what is the optimal load if you want to increase the power or the big central overload, maybe you need more inertia, more weight on the flywheel, 
or less or whatever. So we start to do this uh, process of research and development. Uh, for sure, I, I must say, we, we didn't publish uh, any of this. Maybe, I don't know, 1% uh, of the data, <laughs> data has been published because we are not researchers. And, uh, so sometimes when we have having the opportunity of the of people who were doing their PhD or, or whatever, we took advantage of that and, and we were able to publish. But all the knowledge comes from there, from measuring during uh, a lot of years and in that particular way, uh, learning from the scratch, uh, okay, this exercise, what we have with this exercise is a high power exercise, uh, it's a moral control exercise, whatever. And then we move. That, that is something you, you asked before and didn't uh, reply to you to the entropy uh, wall. You know, that not only looking for power, but also uh, look for how, how is variability evolving in the signal. And we use something that in other fields is is very very common the the entropy approximately the entropy to measure uh, let's say the the chaos or or how how variable is the signal of that particular exercise then from from the bruno fernandez valdez thesis we we learn that this is a parameter that is evolving with the mastery of the movement. So when you are learning a movement and you dominate that movement and you're moving better, the entropy reduce. So mm -hmm. you are able to control the movement. And this is maybe the right time to change the exercise because you are controlling something that maybe is not producing you any Excellent. rich adaptations for your, uh, let's say, moral control. Or, or performance in such a complex uh, world like, like team sports, uh, particularly in, in football. I think that that's a very nice point. So looking for variability within the movements, and as you said, once it's done properly without more variability, you just you just move on. I think that that's that's yeah. great. That's a nice nice way to to show that. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating to hear, and that's really what I wanted to hear from you about the, the history and the development of, of all that. Now I'd like to, to understand a bit more the, the actual application of that within your different context and when you had to move from a club to another and or when, as I said, you know, I came in Paris, I thought we would, we would uh, embrace the approach. I was a little bit familiarized, but I was not as experienced as you guys are or were, you know. So in my case, I could only use it very suddenly with the very individual players. Like there were probably five or six players really using this approach while the others, because lack of buying, lack of experience. And, you know, with, uh, with top players like that, you just don't want to mess up things. You know, if things are going okay as they used to, you don't want to say, I believe this is good, let's do it and then break everything. And, you know, so how have you applied that throughout different environments and buying, uh, progression. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, I must say uh, before I mentioned it, uh, very shortly, shortly, but, uh, I guess the, the boom of all this, uh, became when Roberto Sassi, uh, asked me to join him, not only as Sampdoria, that was the first time I was more, more, uh, a consultant. I did the whole precision and then I moved there every six, six weeks mainly on the international breaks uh, because they didn't have maybe one international player or whatever or two. So most of the team stay at, at the training center. So we were able to introduce new concepts uh, more or less during the, the international periods. And then when we didn't have international periods, every six weeks, uh, more, more or less. So, uh, but, you know, when, when we were able to really stress and, and optimize that for a protein, was a Juventus. Uh, Roberto uh, arrived there and, and he asked me to join him. Uh, and I, I was a huge opportunity because uh, they decide from, from the, the top. Uh, management mm -hmm. to uh, acquire that kind of approach as, as a club approach, the whole club. 
from 14 years old mm. to the first team, everyone must do this kind of approach. And that was a brilliant because I had a lot of, um, let's say, partners who are now the first team in Juventus, like Lucho, Ferrari Bravo, Andrea Bertuzio, Enrico Maffei. They are now the, the strength and conditioning coach uh, on a permanent basis from uh, from Juve. And they are, they are still doing, uh, maybe with variations, because they are different persons and they understand uh, different the, the training approach, but uh, I would say quite, quite similar. So uh, imagine you have not only the first thing, also the, the second team, the Primavera that is called mm -hmm. in, in Italy, and also the, the youth teams. Uh, it was, I don't know, 150 players doing the same thing during, uh, during three consecutive seasons, and also with great, great uh, success on the field. So it, it was like a boom because uh, everything started to, to work, and the feedback was was perfect because we didn't have many injuries. Uh, the team performed at the field okay, and that was the the big push to the mm -hmm. to approach. Um, so then then we were lucky to move to the Italian national team, and I would say more than fifty percent of the player have worked with me in the, in the past. Not only at Juve, but also at, at Sampdoria, and mm -hmm. e even at Barca. I remember Thiago Mota. At the end, uh, I, I worked with him at Barca, and then we were at the national team. So mm -hmm. uh, he, he already knew that kind of of approach. Um, so I was quite lucky to evolve it uh, to the national team. It was five consecutive years working with the whole core of the. Of the of the Juventus uh, players like like Chiellini, Bonucci, Barzagli, Buffon, all these legendary Pirlo, uh, it was five consecutive years. So at the end, they were mastering the approach, and for me, it was quite difficult to evolve because they were so good from doing <laughs> everything. Uh, uh, that was my challenge to all, all the time improve the method to in some way challenge the players to improve more and this is a new exercise, new approach, new mm -hmm. concept and uh, they need to adapt to new things and they were quite happy and uh, upsetting a lot this, this kind of approach. Then we moved to, to Chelsea. Uh, at the beginning was, um, I, I'm not saying hard, but it was difficult to convince to a team that mm -hmm. were not used to do a strength training on a mandatory basis because it was voluntary. So you go to the gym if you want, every time you want, but you don't have any uh, specific session during the, the season. And, and it was, they were surprised because they thought that was only during the pre-season. And we, we keep on going because at that <clears throat> particular season, they were not able to, to play on the, on the European competition because they had a bad season the, the year before. So we had a, a let's say, clean microcycle. So it was perfect because every week we were able to work uh, at least one training session, one specific training session um, for sure, all the activations or, or compensatory training after the sessions. And then also some of the warm-ups, we changed it and, and introduced a small pills of training uh, mainly outdoors so we, we use for that other concepts like uh, elastic bands but this is very important the, the good ones the ones that uh, allows you to to work on the elastic recall uh, part of, of the movement because most of the elastic bands you will find on the market they don't have this elastic component and, and are not useful for that purpose of, of working or, or reaching in, in some way, the eccentric over low levels. You need a, a quite good quality of the latex to find this this kind of, of approach. Otherwise, I know I'm not saying you are losing your time, but you don't have the intensity with elastic bands. So, but that's on on the pitch. So, just like a, yeah, uh, just can you just explain a bit 
more... yeah, mainly, mainly they were using the, the elastic bands uh, in with, with partners most of the time. It could be also doing some specific um, move for for activating the glutes or, or the hamstring or whatever. But they were using with uh, sometimes with a harness or belts or whatever, and they were using the same band and doing uh, 3D movements on the pitch. So uh, when you overstretch this kind of elastic bands with a lot of elastic component, uh, you realize that it's quite difficult to control that move and you have a lot of loading. Uh, the, the big ones, depends on the brand, uh, usually mm -hmm. are, are blue, are navy blue. Uh, uh, I, I've been recording some forces that could reach 100 kilos. It depends on the speed mm -hmm. uh, you move. So. Uh, when you're working in partners and you stretch from both sides of the band, then the elastic band, when it comes to the initial uh, part of the movement, is <laughs> loading you uh, at high speed. Uh, and then you have, with a specific technique on the breaking bar, etc., uh, a really eccentric overload. So you could, in some time, sim simulate what you're doing on the gym with uh, pretty cheap uh, equipment on the pitch and also using balls as a stimulus. So they're doing uh, passes to maybe another partner or their own partner who are working with them at the same time. So we were, you know, evolving this during the, the year, introducing every time more complexity to it mm -hmm. because at the first time they struggled to to control that kind of movements, but then they were amazing. I was maybe maybe that was the the most coordinated team I've been working with. Uh, those guys from Chelsea, they had uh, unique skills on controlling uh, new new moves um, mm -hmm. and complexity. How they were able to manage that it was quite impressive to to see that team working. Excellent. Yeah, I see definitely what, what you mean in terms of like type of exercise where you have, because that's obviously we work better on, on, on video, but you have two players that actually attach to the same bend and one, yeah. one is going on one side, the other one has to resist. And, exactly. and yeah. so, of course, I understand the idea because, of course, it's easy to implement and you, you, you use one to put load on the other. But this is a big part of the, the stuff that I've seen from, from Barcelona about this coordination this interplayer coordination when you try to mimic to coordinate movements have you been much into that as well working in well, pairs you know i've seen, yeah, yeah. I've seen working, some videos working around in that pairs, working in pairs is, is not only something uh, important because of the of the equipment sometimes you don't have enough equipment it's incredible mm -hmm. to say that on, on proteins but sometimes you don't have equipment for all of them uh, so that is a, a good point to work in couples because they serve one band, for example, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you say before, one resists and the other work, but it's it's much better, for example, if they work at the same time. So they overstretch from one side of the band and they go in different directions. So when, they, uh, when the band comes to the initial part of the movement, there is this elastic component that, mm -hmm. um, let's say, reach the players together and they move in, in another direction. So they are overstretching and shortening the band, yep. uh, like accordion all the time and in doing different ways. So that is that is the, let's say the most powerful stimuli because both players are overstretching the band yep. on one side. So then <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, it's difficult to understand if you uh, are, uh, were not able to do it yourself before, mm -hmm. because when you yeah. realize you are inside there and you see the high speed, uh, you really feel the, the fear of uh, collapsing to your player. So that is also important for anticipation. But as you say, that is the way we we develop the interpersonal coordination because in some mm -hmm. way they, they are doing different things or they are opposing a, a force to your partner, but they need to coordinate because otherwise if, if they don't work as a team, those particular because we, we have been working also with four at the same time so we have more more vectors 
in, in different ways and they, they pass the ball. Imagine you have a band, they get inside the band for people and they overstretch the band and they start to pass the ball. What is the problem? When you have that high force from the bands, when you raise your, your foot, you lose the stability from the mm -hmm. contact of foot. Course. So it's so difficult to, to do it. And you realize when you're, you need to pass a person, uh, a partner of a ball, and you have the overloading of the band on your back, and on your waist, because you lose the stability. And that is something we, we introduce also for warm-ups. Instead of doing uh, stupid passes that you don't get anything from that, mm -hmm. uh, you do, uh, you in some way, simulate what is happening when someone pulls you on your hip and you lose the stability and the ball goes goes to the public, for example. Because just a small change yep. on the stability of the hip uh, is a completely wrong um, uh, kicking uh, movement. No, okay, I, I got it. Yeah, that, that's the, the exact term I was looking for, interpersonal coordination, mm -hmm. where you're not doing just the, the, the pure physical, physiological part of it, but you try to integrate so this relationship between the players, which is a part of the overall larger system, which is yeah. based on, on coordination between position. That might even go to mimicking, uh, I don't know, as you said, yeah, behaviors and decision-making into yeah, yeah. warm-ups or into gym exercises. Exactly. And then you have uh, one important thing is sometimes the, the, well, what I ask the player is uh, uh, make things easier to your partner or make things more difficult to, mm -hmm. to your partner. Okay, so this is uh, the, the say double or duality of the interpersonal coordination. Sometimes uh, you need to to increase the difficulty of the exercise or, or you need to reduce because your partner is not able mm -hmm. to yeah. uh, control that particular exercise or, or, or movement. Okay. No, excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. The, the last question I had really on, on, on that specific work, and, you know, we started the whole story about that when you were telling the stuff that you're doing right now um, individually with the individual player you work with, but I guess you still have the same type of dynamic within a team. If you just give us some, let's say, overall orientation of those three typical sessions, which, if I, I'm right, like the compensation, yeah. like the development, and maybe the, the game prep? Yeah, for sure, uh, when you work with an individual player, you need to move after the, the staff or, or, or the team he's working with uh, have done the, the training session. So yeah, you know, uh, you that, was the next, that was my next question, yeah, the coordination. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, it, yeah. Could, it could be that you could anticipate and, and do for example, before the training session, most of the teams in, in uh, Europe, they work on, on during mornings. Uh, we have done sometimes before training sessions, some, some, some training depends on the player because this has been an evolution. And during the last two years, I've been working with at least up to seven different players. Every one of them, they have different schedules, they have different uh, needs or whatever. So. Let's say the usual that is to work on the afternoon with a player. Uh, imagine his, he, he play on, on Sunday and you work with him on, on, on Monday. So that particular uh, session for sure is to help him to, to recover. To recover. But sorry, just to interrupt. Yeah. That might be working or this is something you're going to aim, whatever, is it working just with you or as a team? Like, I don't want to, like, just more overall. What is the, the, the rotation of those three sessions? And ah, then okay. I'd like to know if it's different when you work individually with them and then how you coordinate. But let's start okay, with okay. overall. With the, the general, in general. Yes, yes, okay. please, yes, sorry. So first, for example, with, with our training approach, uh, you, you have the, the option to increase the recovery if you know how to manage the, not only the loading, but also the, the particular stimuli, for example. Uh, now we we talk about about fascia and all this kind of approach more more from the physical therapist part. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been trying to uh, let's say cover the or bridge the, the gap between physical therapists and, and training. 
and we introduce the concept of myofascial training and try to realign all the structures that has been uh, torn or, or are out of place after a match. You know that after a match you have a usually could be heavy or moderate domes mm -hmm. and you have a lot of pain every, everywhere and you're not into the mood uh, about training. But if you compensate all that loading from the mat with some particular stimuli that mainly is related with with what we call the dynamic rotation stability. All this movement with rotations in a very controlled way, using also elastic bands to, to increase this pattern of, of rotation to follow all these myofascial chains, mainly on the, the backside, that is the most uh, prone to, to be out of place, all, all, the, all the posterior chain Okay, exactly, back, mm -hmm. and yep. also the the hamstring it, it kills you after after a match. So uh, also in that particular part we use vibration training, but also we it happens the same as with elastic bands. It must be a high quality vibration. Otherwise, in my opinion, you're losing your time because most of the commercial uh, equipment is not useful because you don't have the intensity and you don't have a proper vibration. And when we have been able to measure. The real vibration that comes from that commercial equipment is maybe one third of what it should be. Mm -hmm. because they they cheat on the on the nominal frequency and <laughs> amplitude of the vibration. So uh, it's it's quite quite different. So uh, vibration helps you also to realign. Uh, it could be more passive or more active uh, vibration. So it's as if it's just the muscle over the platform, and it helps you to in some way drain all the all the waste produced from from your muscles or could be more active to uh, with uh, or, or, let's say over stretching exercise over the over the platform realign that muscles that are at, are not at, at the proper place no? so we do that um, after the matches and i must tell you we usually have a queue of players uh, waiting for us to do that because they feel much better when they when they, they end this kind of session. Then we have in the middle of the week, uh, the problem is if, if you play internationals, you have more problems about that, no? But we try to do in the middle of the week the, the loading session that is something mandatory for all the team, uh, two groups, um, and you have a complete uh, session about all the things I consider the team and particular players are in need for that particular part of the of the season, depending if it's precision during the season, mm -hmm. international week, or, or whatever. Uh, and then we have sometimes uh, the activation before games. The day before the games, that when I start, for example, at Juve, it was something forbidden. But then the players start to to us because they realize it was a, a very very good activation the day before the game, and then it became something mm -hmm. useful, a routine. Uh, yeah, routine that also transfer to before matches. So to to do a very brief activation on the on the locker room before the matches, even with vibrations or with the equipment we were able to to use. Even for example at Juve, the thing. Last, uh, like, like having a, a full team on the stadium, on the new stadium, uh, just on the, on your was a quite big uh, locker room, um, and they had a a big team where also those players who did not play usually had a session to take advantage of this spare time after matches. That yeah, that, that's what I, w I was uh, about to yeah, to ask because yeah. when you said like half, yeah, waiting. There without doing anything, so the coach say, "Okay, let's take advantage because we don't have time for training tomorrow. I need those players to play again, whatever." And exactly. Those players who did not play, they do a, a real, a proper uh, strength training session. And what would be in terms of just one or two key exercises and uh, of reps of this compensation session, for example? Okay, compensation session uh, usually. Uh, 
uh, is a shorter session, usually between 20, could be half an hour a session. Um, for example, we, we look uh, to, uh, if, we, if we talk about, for example, hamstring, they do exercise in a rotational manner, okay, with, for example, an elastic band you have on your, on your shoulder and you put on, over your foot and you do like uh, twisting, twisting the leg and extending the leg. That helps you to realign all, all those muscles. And you really feel better when you do that because in, instead of having, a, a, let's say, a, a stress a structure, you really feel you're losing the, the tension on the structure. So it's, it's one of the keys of the myofascial approach is to do this kind of twisting to put the fascia, uh, let's say, realignment you know, in a proper place. So the muscle would slide better uh, inside this connective uh, tissue. Also for the back, uh, we do the, uh, with the evolution of the TRX, that is the arrow sling, is, is the main branch, so you need just a pulley, and, and you do a twisting with your arms uh, and making also turnings with, with your backs also to put in place again uh, all those muscles from the posterior chain of, of, of your body okay uh, yeah. again here it, it's about different exercises instead of doing a lot of sets mm -hmm. the repetitions it will depend of, of the, the context about yeah the context their feelings uh, I would say between eight and up to fifteen, uh, with each uh, side of, of of the body, it depends also of the feeling. Okay, sometimes could be something that it remains at the same posture, maybe with very very slight sort of movements. Okay, to to put everything in place. Yeah, no, again, and I completely understand. It's very <laughs> difficult to give. Exact exercises, exact uh, reps, uh, because again, it's just so dependent on the players, the history, and everything that is contextual. So that, that I, I, I definitely understand. Um, no, that, that, that's brilliant. I think we, we really went through a nice, nice journey about all the stuff that you developed, you've been through, the, the science behind. Um, I like the fact that what you said that you were still doing a lot of research, but that does not mean publishing. You know, yeah. because you needed the research for your own practice. And that's always been something, of course, we, we, we value as sports scientists and uh, the, the benefit of, of researching. But then the academic exercise is another story. And when you're working full time in a club, it's far from being the priority, even though you need the research for, for your practice, as, as I said. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. Really, I, I all yeah. the time doing this research and development project, uh, even even doing EMGs uh, by <laughs> my own with with partners there, with, because you know you, you have a lot of free time with the teams when the team is working outside. Uh, I take advantage of of doing my research uh, or before or after. You know, everybody knows about the the sports world where you have a lot of empty space during your journey that allows you to, to do this kind of, of apply research and, and okay, what happens if we do this variation? Maybe we have more activation here or we develop more force or mm -hmm. I don't know, more rate of force development if we do this twisting or or, or variation or whatever. So it's, for me, it's uh, quite stimulating to, to do this on a, on a daily basis and uh, try to both uh, Every day, the, the, the approach. Yeah. And on, on that, based on, like, we've been through 20 years of, uh, of, of development with you. What are the things that you think have changed really in your practice or the things that you have stopped doing or the things that you have really changed over, like, if you see yourself, Barcelona 2003 and now? Maybe, maybe. I, I I understood better the needs of the, if we're talking about football, that is my main uh, experience, uh, the needs of the, of a football player. Um, and also to adapt to different contexts, as you say before. 
because, in, for example, in, in the UK, the thing is you have four competitions. That was really difficult to manage. Um, so you need to adapt to that. Um, I, I understand that uh, sometimes it's more important to recover and to compensate all the, all the loading than to train. And you need to, to understand this for some part of the team. The other, those who don't, do not play or, or they play less, uh, maybe you could load. Mm, okay, but imagine also the goalkeepers. Maybe you have three goalkeepers that they don't play ever. So it's a completely different approach and they need training also. So uh, that is a, a, the first point. And then I will say we'll every time to go more outside the gym and develop uh, some tools to work outside in the pitch with specific movements and even uh, have the option of, of taking outside all the all the flywheels to do uh, with the uh, football boots or, or mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, real context movements with the grass or wherever that is uh, because everybody could understand that the contact time on grass or on gym is completely different and how the the foot uh, contact the, the ground yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. Uh, everything the turnings or the unstable environment of the field so that was maybe the, the evolution uh, reached that level of specificity and also I think the players um, accept better because they realize okay we are working or we are simulating what we, we are doing all the time on the field instead of rejecting because it's quite heavy or whatever they realize that this is good for them instead of something that you are overloading just because okay this mm -hmm. is your world and you need to overload the, the yeah that's cool. okay this is helpful for me yeah uh, yeah, right. I have la la last two questions uh, for you. The, 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 the first one is more, uh, it's unrelated to what we just discussed about, is uh, about what are you reading at the, at, the, at the moment? And I know, I'm sure, it's not going to be around uh, strength training, uh, because I know that every time we discuss, I, I discuss more with Julio, the, the philosopher. And uh, in the Eagles book for, for which I interview, you had very, very, let's say, wise views, visions, like managing yourself, and I can tell you, yeah, you are one of a kind and probably also a bit different than the people we tend to, to interact with in, in our world. And I always see you yeah, having some, uh, spending some, t some time outside, back a little bit on, on yourself. So what are you reading, reading at the moment? I'll be curious. Okay. Uh, this is an evolution as always. Uh, you know, like 25 years ago, maybe I had a, a, a seat by my own at the library in the in the sports schools in Barcelona, I was quite very very good friend of the librarians, and they told me you have your seat is, is your seat, you know, with the, your name there. So I spent there I don't know ten hours a day, and at that time, late nineties, it was quite easy to manage all the info. Right now, you know, <laughs> it's no way possible to be updated and to know to even know what is being published. And, um, I don't know, sure. thousands of journals related to our field. Before, we had, I don't know, just 20 journals. Uh, you read maybe 10 of them. So it was quite, quite easy to be updated. Uh, so in some way, I, I suffer from, I don't know if saying burn out or whatever, but mm -hmm. I get bored of the same kind of readings. Uh, you don't find many papers that are uh, providing new things and stimulating uh, reading. So right now, for sure, I read and, and I pass over very, very fast and I say, okay, uh, okay, another. And sometimes you you find a jewel, a pearl of paper that, okay, this is this is the one. So maybe one out of a thousand and, and you read the paper very carefully and, and you enjoy it also. But most of, of the time, I, I spend on reading uh, other fields books. It could be 
as you say, philosophy, could be psychology, could be business administration, uh, or could be other fields, even even medicine, whatever. And right now, baby, I, I'm gonna tell you the last book I, I bought because as I suffered from COVID during this Christmas, I, <laughs> I read a lot of, of books, but maybe this is... Uh, ah, piénsalo otra vez. Otra vez. Think, think again. So it's okay. the, the process of uh, rethinking that Adam Grant, who is a psychology from uh, Wharton School, one of the best school in, in business, in, the first school actually in business in, in the US, uh, this is his last book, And, I, and this is something I was explaining or thinking in another way. That is what he's also referring, that de-learning. De-learning, that is, okay, forget about you thought it was true mm -hmm. and reconsider again Excellent. everything yeah. you know. So it's, it's a pretty good reading because uh, it's the power of knowing what you don't know. This is very hey. important because if you realize Uh, how, how how little you know how, yeah yeah how little you know and how big is the things you don't know uh, first for your humility is is perfect and then it is helping you to feed your curiosity curiosity for me is the most important skill you must have as a professional because if you lose curiosity And, and the eager to know new things, you're dead. Life mm. is, is heavy and you have a lot of stress and a lot of bad things that is happening. But if you keep that for you, your inner passion, your inner strength to, to know new things um, and enjoying to reconsider, that is, es, Escotado, that is a very important philosophy in Spain who passed away uh, like a few months ago, used to say this very nice sentence. Uh, learning is about enjoying, uh, enjoying about uh, reconsider your your opinion. So to change your opinion, you change your opinion because you realize that is something mm -hmm. better uh, there, and, and you enjoy that instead of being uh, pissed off or angry because mm -hmm. okay uh, I was wrong. No, good, you were wrong. So uh, enjoy from that. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Oh, that's perfect. Um, I think we can leave it here. Uh, thanks for for joining us, uh, Julio, and um, yeah, again, talk soon. Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin, for your invitation.